author's preface of philomene's marriages this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by celine major philomene's marriages by henri greville translated by helen stanley author's preface to philomene's marriages to my american readers readers you who take the trouble to buy my book and to read it though you afterwards should curse the unlucky author who offers you exactly the contrary to what you desire a gay story when you are in a bad humour a sad one when you have every reason in the world for wishing to be amused permit me to introduce myself to you so many absurd things have been said about me that a little truth i think will do good to every one in the first place my readers it has been said that i am russian that my husband is russian and that my education was russian nothing is more untrue i was born in paris where i was educated in the bosom of my family and then the time having come for me to earn my own living i followed my father to russia it was there i became acquainted with the language and the customs of that country but i had married a frenchman and our love for our native land drew us homewards at first i began by passing a few months every year in france and my countrymen seemed to me as interesting to study as russians they had not for me the attraction of the unknown but i had strengthened my faculties of observation and i remarked a thousand points of interest in them where others only saw everyday life the commonplace of home existence the yearning towards our country became so strong that seven years ago we returned to paris and here it is that i have written all my works except one short novel and two or three stories tell me my readers why should i be obliged never to describe any other than russian society and by what strange law should i be forbidden to exert my powers of observation in regard to my countrymen it is in order that i may be allowed to do this that i present philomene to you to-day this person does not approach perfection even in a remote way but none are perfect except doubtlessly the critics who like bayard are sans peur et sans reproche it is probably from this immense idiosyncrasy that some of them have informed you that my husband is a russian nobleman and that i have no knowledge whatever of french habits and society they will read this and remain impeccable for that is one of their common attributes i take all the more interest in describing french life to you since i have learned american readers that you have shown me a great deal of indulgence and that my name is perhaps as familiar to you as to my own countrymen this amiability on your part makes me desire to thank you as far as it is in my power and i think i may be rendering you a service in giving you a truthful idea of french life the novels of my contemporaries that are the most frequently read in other countries are devoted to painting the exceptions of life both in regard to good and evil my desire is to make you know french people as they are as one meets them in the street at the theatre in shops at their own houses especially at their own houses in their modest homes which are as respectable and as well ordered as the greater part of those in other countries we have been given the reputation of a people who are never at home whose women are all perverse whose men all bad alas for the interest that criminals inspire thank god also for the cause of morality we are an honest people whose sons respect their mothers whose mothers sacrifice themselves for their children whose husbands are devoted ones and whose wives are courageous and loving exactly as they are elsewhere no more so perhaps but not less so than in other countries i fear that the aureole of fire that crowns our perverse brows will grow dim in the eyes of those who read my books there will be some perhaps who will cease to take any interest in us as soon as we shall no longer appear altogether horrible but if some desert us the great majority i feel sure will rejoice in thinking that we also know what are the pure joys of the fireside the contentment of duty accomplished and the ineffable tenderness of family life after all those of our people who fought at your side for your independence in the last century were not vulgar chevaliers of scandalous adventures and not in boudoirs had they learned to love justice and liberty you remember this perhaps at times my american readers and you will be glad to know that the mothers of our country bring up sons who are worthy of their ancestors that is better than attaining the brilliant and unhealthy renown of heroes of romance finally if i may have been able to inspire you with this wholesome view i shall be very happy my american readers and you also i am sure henri greville paris france january eighteenth eighteen seventy nine end of the author's preface
chapters one two and three of philomene's marriages by henri greville translated by helen stanley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter one philomene's sorrows you see my dear lady i have had much trouble concluded the widow wiping her eyes and still i much fear i am not at the end of it why asked madame aubier innocently because the money affairs are not finished and i am sure my late husband's family will not arrange them advantageously for me you could not ask them that said the good lady not without some evidence of good sense your husband married you in spite of them they have no reason whatever for benefiting you in that division since two years that this has continued it seems to me however that they might have ended it but madame philomene crepin left her phrase unfinished and her confidant tried to terminate it for her but they hope to weary your patience by their delays no philomene replied energetically it is i who retard them and they will end by yielding from weariness if not with a good grace ah said madame aubier regarding the widow with a certain admiration mingled with surprise at this clever conception of which she had not believed her capable the two women remained silent for a moment and philomene's confidant profited by this time of repose to look discreetly out of the window which she had on her left side a wan light penetrated through this window ornamented with little white calico curtains the red cords that gathered up the soft folds of the calico that had no stiffness in it did not succeed in giving it a hospitable aspect any more than did some flowers placed on the inside of the window on a pine shelf made for the purpose that rested on two crossbars the flowers it must be confessed were not of those whose engaging appearance invites sight or smell they were superb cacti of all species ball pear racket and candle-shaped and all bristling with menacing points and thorns nature has not willed that cacti should be attractive when they are not in bloom perhaps a certain mysterious affinity was the reason of the passion which madame crepin felt for fat plants the bureau surmounted by a looking-glass that was hung at a height that rendered it perfectly superfluous served as an étagère and a prodigious quantity of strange and useless objects encumbered it from the wall to its extreme edge exotic shells porcelain figures small baskets made of plaited straw carved coconuts in a word all the rubbish that is found in seaports in sailors homes and in the houses of their relations and friends an inspection of this bureau amply sufficed to prove that m crepin in his lifetime had been a merchant captain the rest of the furniture that was neat and simple differed in no wise from that which is seen in the homes of modest provincial bourgeois the floor was of stone large slabs of schist worn by the feet of several generations were joined unequally forming little cavities where the house dame's broom waged redoubtable combats with dust every day violet-coloured chintz bed curtains a large and handsome cupboard of old oak wood a round table covered with oilcloth and a large cat in the immense chimney-place with its pine mantelpiece blackened by smoke completed the arrangement of this tidy but unattractive room it rains does it not asked madame crepin following her friend's look yes but not very hard however there goes monsieur lavenel the widow controlled a very slight impulse that urged her towards the window then she wiped her eyes once more with her handkerchief ah my poor lady continued she how much unhappiness one has in life you have had your share philomene said madame aubier in a conciliatory tone you can hope for better days and not to reproach the captain's memory you are more at peace than you have ever been since his death madame crepin sighed sailors wives are very unhappy said she if their husbands are on shore they tremble lest they shall go away and when they are at sea it is far worse but philomene i could never understand why you married a sailor your father kept a small shop you could have carried it on or begun housekeeping with some good fellow who would have given you help one makes a fortune in such wise while with a sailor one spends all one has i never liked trade madame aubier said the widow confidentially laying her hand on her visitor's knee i detested brown sugar ground pepper and chicory i swore to myself i would leave shopkeeping and i have left it madame aubier said to herself i don't see that you have gained anything by it but as she was a prudent and clever woman she kept her reflection to herself the man who bought the business from you after your brother's inheritance has done well he has enlarged the shop by half and now he has begun to sell pork Faux, philomene said disdainfully 
to sell grease and always to have soiled hands is not a fine trade they have however married their daughter very well madame aubier answered more vivaciously and their son-in-law did not find their money dirty to whom did you tell me they married her asked philomene with an absent air her sullen look following attentively the expressions on the face of the good lady without the latter's perceiving it to a member of the chamber of commerce of havre the son of father martinet who made fifteen thousand francs income in the brandy trade a notable tradesman all that is desirable the widow crepin indicated by a disdainful movement of her shoulders that a notable tradesman of havre weighed no more than a straw in her scales there are some for all tastes she then said i know very well had i been a man i would never have married the daughter of a lard merchant your husband though married a grocer's daughter replied madame aubier provoked to maliciousness by philomene's conversation come my dear don't set yourself up you well know that no trade is despicable and besides your father-in-law was a simple fisherman from granville there is nothing to be said against those who having begun from the bottom of the ladder ascend it we are all equal before the lord it is only our virtues or our faults that make a difference the widow crepin did not answer she owed madame aubier five hundred francs and bestowed all the more consideration upon her because she had no decided intention of paying them back to her before an extremely distant epoch besides madame aubier was the wife of a retired infantry captain a government employé she was rich at least comparatively to her slightly gilded mediocrity madame aubier had no children and her servant cooked exceedingly well now philomene liked delicate bits and then one met a great many people at this person's house and always very nice people so she must not quarrel with such a desirable person then continued madame aubier desirous of palliating by a mark of interest what there might have been bitter in her recent lecture you are going to leave off mourning on sunday alas leave off mourning it is not leaving off mourning to put white and black on my bonnet instead of plain crape i shall never wear light colours surely but black is so soiling and then two years of mourning is all that one can exact concluded madame aubier smiling do you know philomene i have an idea that you will marry again i good lord ah oh, if ever such a thought comes to me it will be because i shall have lost my reason after all my sorrows the loss of my husband and that of my three children ah oh, madame aubier i believed you had a better opinion of me there is no harm in one's wishing to marry again answered the honest woman unmoved the harm would be in allowing one's self to be courted by gallants and not wishing to get remarried this is not your case philomene but don't say you are not going to be married or else they might ask you why you raise up the corner of your curtain when monsieur lavenel goes by in the morning and your room is not yet arranged who told you so the widow began crimson with confusion and probably also with anger but she remembered very fortunately that madame aubier lived opposite to her on the other side of the street and that she had no need of asking information on that chapter the good lady smiled and her double chin shook complacently on the white silk handkerchief she always wore around her neck it is very natural she continued lavenel is not ugly he is not stupid they say he is a little hard towards people but husbands are not always the same to their wives as they are to other persons it might be he would make a good husband ah madame aubier stop your discourse or else i shall think you wish to pain me after having loved my poor crepin so much can you believe i would desire to marry a lavenel my husband was a hundred times handsomer and nicer and it is not lavenel who could make me forget him as you will philomene as you will it is your affair and not mine besides affection does not come at command nor hatred either now as it rains no longer i will return home good evening do you wish an umbrella madame aubier said the widow eagerly why no thanks the rain is over and besides it would not be necessary just to cross the street well good evening philomene till one of these days till one of these days madame aubier many thanks for your visit on this normand formula that does not mention any date the two ladies separated philomene re-entered her home and stout madame aubier panting and smiling nodded to the gossips on their doorsteps and hastened to cross the street lavenel she said with contempt out loud when she found herself alone lavenel a fine match for me i shall want something better than that when i have made up my mind 
chapter two a proposal the night had come philomene who as we have said did not dislike good eating was just about removing from the fire a veal cutlet with its usual accompaniment of green peas and inhaled with a voluptuous melancholy the appetizing odor of her supper voluptuously one understands why with melancholy because meat is so dear an indiscreet hand knocked twice on the door and immediately a visitor entered ah it is you monsieur lavenel said philomene in a tone that had nothing engaging in it yes neighbor it is myself do i disturb you the widow had had time to cover the saucepan and to deposit it on the hearth she approached the intruder saying to him oh no oh no exactly as though she had said oh yes oh yes you see i gathered some cherries a little while ago before the rain madame crepin they are not wet don't be afraid and i have brought you a few the few cherries quite filled a basket which their owner placed on the table with that sort of pride which it is agreed to call modesty but monsieur lavenel i shall never eat all those exclaimed the widow a little softened you can make them into preserves returned the gallant visitor sugar is so dear murmured philomene contemplating the cherries with a sad eye bah said the bachelor with an easy air in your position one can procure oneself many sweets that is where you deceive yourself energetically answered madame crepin you must not imagine that i am well off i have hardly enough to make the two ends meet and only do so by depriving myself of everything anyhow don't deprive yourself of cherries here are some that only ask to be eaten lavenel with an absent air plunged his hand into the basket and took out a handful of fruit which he began to nibble slowly keeping the stems and pits in his left hand philomene looked at him with a curious air he raised his head and met her look which instantly became full of sweetness happily thought lavenel i know you or otherwise i should think you as sweet as honey ah that would be an illusion as this phrase could not be translated into civilized language he added out loud you distress yourself a great deal do you not madame crepin about what my dear monsieur the widow asked prudently why about everything at being alone at being a widow for having lost your children philomene wiped her eyes at seeing your affairs drag on so long without ending do you wish me to say something it needs a man to carry on all that you will never get out of it all alone they have told me so observed philomene with a wise air after half a second she added but i have no relations near enough to burthen themselves with my affairs it is not necessary to be related in order to help one another neighbor returned lavenel after having allowed an appreciable time to elapse as though he had been meditating his answer i am not a relation of yours but if i can be of service to you in anything oh monsieur lavenel you know very well that that could not be what would they say of it round about said philomene modestly lowering her eyes they can say what they choose neighbor and then all that they might say would not perhaps be far off from the truth philomene who had remained standing until then sat down turning her back to the light and lavenel in order to master his eloquence the better laid on the corner of the table the little heap of stems and pits that he held in his left hand they will say you have friendship for me and that i have the same for you as far as concerns myself at least they will not lie for i have friendship for you madame crepin and a great deal of it madame crepin smiled faintly and her interlocutor sat down opposite her if you would continued he confidentially we might make a pair of friends you are in a nice position ah neighbor i am very poor i do not know who could have spoken to you about my position certainly it is not an enviable one well then neighbor you must change it for another triumphantly concluded lavenel you talk very easily about it murmured philomene making some little folds in her apron which she held in her left hand you have only a word to say madame Grépin? proffered lavenel rising and placing his hand on his heart theodore lavenel grain and flour merchant offers you his hand and his fortune philomene continued to gather together two or three more little folds of stuff then she opened her hand and let them all escape at once you do me a great deal of honor neighbor she answered in a wheedling voice do you accept cried the grain and flour merchant making a step towards her excuse me neighbor i do not like trade 
said philomene with the same sweet voice lavenel stood stupefied his mouth half open nothing had made him foresee this answer the widow was not in the habit of being according to the language of the country more amiable than is necessary and certainly she had received her visitor very well until then the latter might have therefore prided himself on her especial kindness whence came this unexpected refusal this he asked her as soon as his surprise permitted him to speak i do not like trade repeated madame crepin with an amiable smile you know it well neighbor for since i have been in the world i have not ceased saying so that is not a good reason replied lavenel one might not like trade and still not dislike a tradesman madame crepin smiled again and lowered her eyes then her face regained an expression of resigned sadness neighbor said she after all the sorrows i have had after having loved my poor husband as i loved him the thought even of marriage is very painful to me and then added she without looking at her pursuer my mourning is not even finished as you will neighbor replied the grain and flour merchant this perhaps is not your last word he went towards the door accompanied by philomene who looked at him askant with his hand on the latch he turned i have an idea repeated he that this is not your last word perhaps not said the widow with a nod of her head before the astounded lavenel could utter a word he was already in the street and the door was shut the odd woman murmured he as he regained his shop if she had not her few sous i would send her to the deuce the conceited creature while the subject of this discourse returned to her cutlet with a smile as enigmatical if not as sweet as the jaconde m lavenel entered his home where his mother was awaiting him behind the counter knitting indigo blue woollen stockings the dye coming off on her fingers well said the old woman pushing her fifth needle under the band of her normand coif with its two winged like sides looped up she refused said her son with a sullen air refused but not really not entirely replied the cunning old peasant no not entirely how could you know mother that she only half refused me because i know this crepin woman she is an arrant coquette and a vain creature there is however no reason for her being so murmured lavenel thinking of the yellow hair and pointed nose of the lady of his thoughts ah yes son there is a reason master toussaint's underclerk passed here a little while ago when you were in town the crepin has some valuable land near pieux worth fifteen thousand crowns at least and what is more once her accounts of heritage are settled with her husband's debtors she will have five or six thousand francs in ready money the late crepin's family has consented to yield her the credits coming to the estate on condition that she pays the legal expenses lavenel remained thoughtful his mother looked at him as she was knitting and patiently awaited the fruit of his reflections does she know it asked he at length i do not believe so the underclerk told me the letter only arrived this morning she will be prouder still growled lavenel ah if i were only not in need of money he threw his hat on the counter with a gloomy air there are other girls or widows in the world observed his mother yes but the devil willed it that i should have a fancy for that one formerly i wish i may be hanged if i know why she was pretty in former days before her marriage she has gotten well over it philosophically observed madame lavenel beauty is a perishable gift yes she has gotten over it and yet i know not why when i see her faded as she is something stirs my heart it is perhaps because i loved her so much in past times if i marry her now it will be in order to beat her yes to be at her at my ease so as to revenge myself for all her impertinences did she say neither yes or no to you madame lavenel asked as she went to shut the shop door she said no and then after she said perhaps you well know her cursed habit of never saying anything positively it is a wise habit my son replied the old normand woman it would be better to imitate it than to blame it it is wise when it profits ourselves but it is very disagreeable when it does us harm answered her son as he followed her into the back shop for supper but never mind that i'll catch her yet that widow crepin 
i'll catch her surely and when she is my wife she shall pay me back for all my cringings chapter three hunting a husband the following sunday madame crepin made her appearance in the church at Zielette in a bonnet trimmed with lilac and white marguerites a pretty quite new lilac cravat displayed itself under her chin and proclaimed to all that her mourning was over mourning in the country which is much more severe than that worn in large cities ordains black for two years half mourning colours not daring to make their appearance before the expiration of that period and as madame crepin had loved her husband a great deal there were some rigorous persons who declared she ought to have waited at least six months before she left off entire black do leave the poor women alone said stout madame aubier to a group of matrons who were sharply criticising the widow's marguerites what matters it to you whether she wears lilac or green at her neck has she mourned her husband any less because of it there was no reason for mourning for him so much preferred an angular neighbour in his lifetime she complained enough and said he never came on shore without leaving her with a child on her arms leave the dead in peace continued the good soul the captain and his children sleep tranquilly under their crosses it is very little matter to them now whether madame crepin wears mourning for two or ten years she will marry again soon said another friend and neighbour lavenel goes there every day well what if she should marry again after all the affected airs she put on at the time of the captain's funeral it was because she has a tender heart cunningly glided in a third friend and neighbour she loved her husband very well she will love her second one still better ah but you see the first one had a very great merit that perhaps a second would not have he was scarcely ever with her good heavens exclaimed madame aubier what bad tongues women have far from taking this remark as an injury the neighbours and friends grouped themselves around the stout lady they don't talk as much about you said the boldest because you madame aubier are neither proud nor wicked if everybody was like you the world would go on better come come that's very well said the excellent creature for love of me since i am so good try then to disparage your neighbour a little less there are neighbours and neighbours exclaimed a last kind tongue behind madame aubier who was going away quite out of breath towards her house and who could not reply the subject of this conversation had returned majestically to her home amid many scrutinizing looks when her door was shut she approached the damp covered mirror and raised herself on the points of her large feet in order to contemplate therein the effect of her ribbons lilac was becoming to her that was incontestable under the ruches and flowers of her bonnet her face assumed an unwonted sweetness philomene had been handsome rather than pretty her regular features once delicate had grown large and sunburn had hardened her skin as she was when an amiable expression animated her face she was still good-looking but in repose in her everyday dress nothing could deceive one from seeing she was thirty-eight years old and that she wore her years bravely with a certain complacency she untied the strings of her bonnet and placed it on a candlestick that held a candle giving it the effect of a mushroom and then she put on a white muslin cap and proceeded to prepare her dinner while taking her repast solitarily philomene went over in her mind the events of her life this day was a sort of solemnity to her a kind of new era in her existence none of the remarks whispered in a low tone in the church none of the scrutinizing and curious glances directed at her bonnet had escaped her and with the surety of memory that characterizes people who bear rancor long she had classed them all in her mind so as to revenge herself at her leisure according to time and opportunity but the important result she had obtained destroyed the bitterness of all those sarcasms in laying her mourning aside openly she had prepared people's minds for a second marriage and when this event should take place it would be a surprise to no one yes i will marry again she said to herself in order to entertain herself yes certainly after having passed the best years of my life in waiting for a husband who was always absent i will marry again and i will wed a very good-looking and very nice man who will always remain with me this thought inspired her with an idea to go and look in her cellar for a bottle of wine ordinarily she drank cider in order to make a feast for herself of this day's solemnity she poured out a glass of old bordeaux which the captain had brought home in days past and continued the current of her meditations but i must have a husband of a different stamp from lavenel a pretty bird truly that poor man with his prune-like eyes and his punch's nose he is not even five feet high i must have a large handsome man such as my late husband was only younger 
i don't wish to give people cause for laughter on this reflection philomene dipped a biscuit in her wine and ceased talking to herself so as to reflect in silence the captain's memory which had been brusquely thrown in the midst of her plans for the future had evoked many far-off thoughts she had always been proud and in the small village they had declared her to be unmarriageable several aspirants chosen by relations and tacitly accepted by herself had found themselves ousted at the end of a few weeks without anything on their part having been a motive for this insult each marriage that failed was not long in being followed by some new demand and certain persons thought they remarked that the newcomer had some advantages over the old ones philomene made of the pretenders to her hand a sort of social ladder of which she pitilessly broke the rounds as soon as she found a higher one the original manner of elevating herself had won for her a number of criticisms some harmless the others bitter on the part of the discarded persons and their families they spoke jestingly of philomene's marriages and soon there could not be found in the country a man bold enough to pay her court besides the young men recognized the uselessness of their efforts although the young girl's dot who was an only child and her parents inheritor was modest enough even for that country it was clear she could marry neither a merchant nor a farmer and these two classes were about the only ones to which she could pretend there still remained at Ziolette a notary several retired merchants and the captains of some small coasters but the first sought a wife from a higher sphere the second were too old and were besides for the most part married and the last were of too small account philomene entered her twenty-seventh year without having found the husband of her dreams she possessed at granville a cousin younger than herself an amiable pretty merry girl full of amusing originality this latter had a very strange fate she was scarcely eighteen years of age when a novelist then unknown had come to take sea baths at their beach the young man who was inflamed with a desire to write there composed his best romance for he fell desperately in love with the pretty crevette fisher and married her at the end of three months never had folly a happier ending the young woman was intelligent she understood that she owed it to her husband never to make him blush for her and she learned all that she ignored with a rare wisdom and one that could not have been expected in her she desired to remain at granville until she became perfectly polished her husband acceded to this desire what did granville or paris matter to him provided his wife was with him the small personal fortune which he possessed permitted him to live liberally in the country while in paris it would have given him hardly the necessaries of life a sojourn of three years in that interesting country in the midst of continuous application was at least as useful to charles verroy as to his wife for he carried away from thence a ripe original talent that soon won him a position just as philomene wearied with awaiting at Ziolette for a husband who did not appear had decided to go and seek for one elsewhere she heard of her young cousin's projected marriage it was a good opportunity for seeing the country philomene ordered herself a gown and bonnet and left to be present at the wedding it was a magnificent wedding all granville was present for the marriage of this young girl without fortune or education with a gentleman from paris who had four thousand francs income seemed as fabulous to the people of the place as if a king had married a shepherdess for it must not be forgotten that thirty years ago this country was yet a virgin land to the footsteps of people from the outer world among the guests was a merchant captain who had recently arrived from brazil to see his mother philomene was amiable she was pretty she was known to possess some fortune the marriage was arranged in the twinkling of an eye and three months later she was madame crepin she held at last the ideal dreamed of all her life to be the wife of a conspicuous person it is something to have gained one's end and many among us leave this world without being able to boast of having done so but the end one pursues in life is not a silver service placed at the top of a greased pole it is a moving cloud that changes form as one makes one's way on the road of existence madame crepin's end had been to be madame crepin but when she was in possession of this title she wanted something else at first she would have liked not to have been encumbered with a brood of children heaven in its bounty accorded her five it is true she lost three of them in an epidemic and two shortly after which gave her rest but it was eight years of her happiness and her ambition lost for one is not of much account oneself when one is surrounded by cradles just as she was beginning to enlarge her fortune and embellish her home the captain had an unlucky fall and fractured his skull philomene found herself a widow her sorrow was great for this narrow-hearted woman had loved her husband her love was rather material 
the better part of ourselves the disinterested tenderness the simple kindness that we feel in our affections when we possess an elevated soul had little in common with the jealous and hot-headed passion that characterized philomene but this passion was love and madame crepin sincerely mourned her husband then after a few months a peculiar feeling a sort of well-being quietly came over her it had been very doleful to see the earth cover the captain's coffin but it was certainly something to be able to listen to the wind moaning around the house with the sweet peacefulness of having no one out at sea rage tempest rage philomene who was addicted to monologues would say thou troublest me no longer now when other people's children were screaming enough to rend one's ears she was wont to throw a quiet look around her well-arranged little home there were no mischievous fingers to write with preserves on the furniture no playthings on the floor no linen hung at the windows no broth to make in the evening no small stockings to mend at night and a sort of pleasant tremor passed over philomene as she thought of her peaceful present life the well-thinking reader and especially if the reader be the mother of a family will be indignant with the author and exclaim loudly that such monsters do not exist a thousand pardons men and women readers they do exist they are to be found everywhere perhaps in your tailor your shoemaker your washerwoman your cousin's son-in-law dear madam when she lives no more your brother-in-law's nephew dear sir who will mourn for him deeply and properly with a very sincere heart who will give him a superb funeral and a year after while wiping the glasses of his lorgnette at the opera will think that after all he did very well to die since his death procures for him the possibility of such sweet pleasures such feelings are not confessed they are not even felt in a very definite manner they remain in a vague and embryo state but if the dead even those who are sincerely mourned should think of coming back and reclaiming their goods how they would be sent before the courts with their right of troubling the living contested so philomene was happy in her tranquillity which nothing troubled any more and this happiness had lasted about ten months when a gnawing worm glided into her bosom with the captain had disappeared the renown of her position a merchant captain is a personage and then he brings home from his distant voyages extraordinary objects strange gifts and fancy things that cannot be found for gold or silver in any shop each one of his returns is awaited and commented upon his departures are an event in the small village where his family resides he is given commissions for the other side of the ocean but when the captain dies his widow is of very little importance she falls into the rank of neutral unclassed beings unless she has a large fortune for as every one knows a large fortune is the best of gifts how should she regain her vanished prestige at first the widow occupied herself anxiously in realizing the greatest amount of money and real estate possible and thanks to diverse negotiations made half willingly and half by force she obtained from her husband's family a much larger share than she deserved but how could one refuse a woman who had had five children and so much sorrow was it not very natural to accord her a little well-being for her old age although philomene had made her husband quarrel with all his own people from the first month of their marriage the crepin family acted honourably the sole point on which it showed itself recalcitrant was that of the recovering of the credits and even there they were obliged to yield in the end as the notary's underclerk had informed madame lavenel her fortune was thus assured but it was a very paltry fortune something about eighteen hundred francs income a woman who had refined tastes like philomene could not be satisfied with so little besides she had always dreamed of buying a piano not for herself for she had never had leisure to learn music in spite of the great desire to do so that she had manifested in the first days of her marriage the captain had only laughed at it saying that when one is twenty-seven years old it was too late to become a virtuoso she desired one for the persons who should come to see her should those people know how to play on it now with eighteen hundred francs income one cannot buy a piano even though it should be a kettle-drum well then what remained at thirty-seven years of age life is not over there are women who marry for the first time when they are thirty-seven and even thirty-eight years old they are old maids it is true but a widow of thirty-eight is a young widow and can aspire to a young and well-made husband as they used to say formerly the young and well-made husband was an agreeable perspective but far more brilliant still was what he might bring with him the captain's grade became as in former times philomene's aspirants a ladder 
no longer a modest ladder a little nothing of a ladder but a pedestal on which to mount up higher lavenel he was a fine aspirant in truth however grain and flour merchant though he was lavenel must not be rebuffed the wise always reserve a pair for thirst and then who does not know that immutable decree that a woman who is courted attracts gallants just as the light attracts moths philomene needed a jumping-jack at the end of a string to show the entire world that she possessed the power of making the ambitious hearts of men who were seduced by her charms and her money bound lavenel made a good jumping-jack he was well enough known in the village and in the neighborhood for philomene to feel flattered at hearing whispered he wants to marry the widow crepin very much she thought his mother disagreeable enough it is true for first the mother of the man she would marry would be naturally disagreeable to her and then madame lavenel was too proud too silent too far-seeing philomene only liked imbecile people around her she sovereignly despised them but she did not need to esteem her neighbor there are persons who cannot live with those whom they despise the widow crepin on the contrary would have liked the earth to hold no others it is so sweet to reign over those who surround one and to say to oneself morning and evening on opening and shutting one's eyes to the light all those people are simpletons and i lead them at my good pleasure philomene was enjoying within herself the sweetness of this thought when the letter-carrier knocked at her door thinking it was only the channel lighthouse she arose with an absent air and took two steps to her great surprise the carrier laid the journal and two letters on the bureau End of chapters 1, 2, and 3chapters four and five of philomene's marriages by henri greville translated by helen stanley this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four an old suitor two letters who could have written to her unless it were her notary but he had written to her the day before to announce to her the happy success of her negotiations philomene looked at the two letters for a long while weighed them in her hand smelt of them carefully and at last began with the lighter and less elegant-looking one it was from a parisian debtor who being informed that she was charged with the recovery of the credits of her husband's heritage wrote to announce to her that the state of his affairs would not permit him to pay her immediately that besides her credit had not been proved in a proper manner and that finally he should carry the affair before a council of referees philomene knit her eyebrows that were as white as those of an albino put the letter in the envelope and the envelope in a drawer and mentally sent the debtor to the devil after that operation the widow crepin turned to the second envelope that remained on the corner of the bureau and looked at it askantly was it also this stupid letter going to bring her some disagreeable news and thus spoil the pleasure of such a beautiful day this mysterious epistle had however rather a pleasing air the paper was handsome and heavy and besides it did not come from paris after a short moment's hesitation madame crepin tore the envelope why do they put gum even into the most ignored corners of envelopes why is it that one can never open them till after a deadly struggle is it so necessary that manufacturers should condemn one to a bodily combat with that unseizable and soft enemy which we call a sheet of lined paper a combat where one's teeth are often and as last resource the instrument of slaughter it is a question which we lay before the jury for prizes at the exposition in order that it may decide whether the secrecy of correspondence is better guarded by such violent measures than by a simple seal after having made every effort to open the letters she held in her hand philomene went in a very bad humour to her work-box armed herself with a pair of scissors and thrust in their points and as generally happens in such cases she cut the sheet of paper in two which at last she drew forth glorious but mutilated from its protecting sheath then madame crepin sent to the devil probably to keep the parisian debtor company who perhaps found it lonely there the scissors maker the envelope seller and the person who had written to her after which she looked at the signature marie verroy it was marie her cousin from granville who had written to her after five or six years of absolute silence philomene thought she must desire to borrow money from her and put on her most severe expression just as if the young woman were opposite to her in person gradually her face smoothed itself out as much as it was in its power to do not any more though nevertheless and she ended in really smiling when she came to the signature 
Mary remembered her and recalled to her some pleasant days passed together formerly, sometimes at Granville, sometimes at Dialette, when their parents made each other their annual visits, and asked if she could not find for her in her vicinity one or two rooms for a few days. They were making an excursion along the coast and would like to stop about a week at that pretty little miniature seaport. But certainly, certainly, Philomene answered out loud, the room is already found, the one I have on the first floor and you can stay here my dear cousin as long as it seems pleasant to you the joy and glory of having charles verroy in her house a celebrated man a novelist whose works were displayed in the windows of booksellers at cherbourg at coutances and even elsewhere made philomene insensible to the expense she immediately appreciated what this honour was going to cost her she would be obliged to have two meals a day with meat and vegetables a few fowls philomene raised some in the small courtyard preceding her garden a little fish and the captain's wine would receive rather a rude assault yes but all dielette would be aware that she sheltered the celebrated verrois her cousin and then a kindness is never lost and that is why one should have a generous soul philomene took a chair and drew towards her the captain's travelling inkstand it was a heavy machine with a spring cover that went off sometimes by itself in the middle of the night causing the large grey cat sleeping in the chimney-place frights that were as sudden as inexplicable black streaks all around it proved unmistakably that rust had not always respected it however philomene experienced a worthy pleasure in writing from the captain's inkstand it was one of the things that gave her importance in her own eyes she wrote on paper with a wide black border she had never been able to find a border sufficiently wide and if one had listened to her it would have been necessary to have manufactured some especially for her with a thickness two fingers and a half wide in her eyes it was an elegance that constituted luxury as understood by fashionable people she wrote therefore on very correct paper and her legible flowing writing soon covered the first page not without a slight tendency towards climbing heavenward but philomene had such high aspirations my dear cousin wrote madame crepin your letter gave me great pleasure proving to me that you had not forgotten me nor have i either forgotten you i have thought of you constantly you know doubtless about my sorrows and of my poor husband's death captain crepin left me in a very sad position in spite of that my here philomene wrote the word poverty then she stopped to reflect it did not enter into her plans that they should think her poor so she artistically effaced the word poverty with the end of her little finger which made on the fine paper bordered with black a very ugly greyish spot but the widow's aesthetical ideas did not go so far as to blame this summary infantine procedure of erasing a displeasing expression instead of poverty she put modest circumstances and continued does not prevent me from offering you the little i possess you my dear marie and also my cousin charles will find in my home a very simple hospitality but offered with a warm heart and i hope you will find yourself sufficiently pleased to remain a much longer time than you have at present the intention of doing this epistle finished not without one or two little blots that madame crepin made likewise disappear with the end of her finger which gave them the appearance of long-haired comets thrown out in a shadow on a light sky the widow re-read it examining with care whether some malicious fault in spelling had not glided in among the difficult words there were in truth one or two but they escaped her investigation and the post carried them off the next day towards granville together with many others of like calibre on the afternoon of this memorable day philomene went out to take the air all that dielette held that was nice was walking on the beach admiring one of the most beautiful sunsets that could be seen the sea blue as the mediterranean furled gently with pretty foam-like fringes over the impalpable fine sands the sun disappeared gradually in a light cloud of golden vapour and the english islands were thrown out in the distance violet-coloured on the gilded or as one might say incandescent sea and sky the white cliffs of origny arose opposite and seemed quite near the bay of auville that incomparable bay shut in by two magnificent promontories has but one fault which is a merit that of being unknown when the day comes that tourists shall have invaded it it will be perfect and insupportable like all celebrated places the inhabitants of dielette are blasé in regard to the magnificence of their sunsets and we have never heard it said that the place has given birth to a painter talk after that of the preponderant influence of natural beauty on the artistic development of a people however the sweetness of the evening the beauty of the spectacle had touched the most surly and all even a former mate 
who since his retirement invariably turned his back to this sea which he despised on account of its tranquil waters after so many stormy campaigns all looked towards the west attracted in spite of themselves by so much brilliancy and such an intense display of splendour madame philomene went like the others on the beach clad in the lilac insignias of her new situation and stopped here and there to exchange a good evening with different persons it is proper to say here that in spite of her ambition and its momentary realization madame crepin had never been admitted into what formed the nucleus of fashionable society in the maritime village her origin was not the cause of this restriction but rather the dear lady's haughty airs when first married she desired to be first among the first but to achieve that she would have been obliged to have taken some one's place now the first held to their rank which was natural and philomene who with more patience might have insinuated herself adroitly towards the goal of her desires found herself repulsed with that cold politeness that makes one feel so sensibly the distance between the great ones of this world and simple mortals like philomene you or i madame aubier who was in the best society did not make herself so exclusive and madame crepin had free access to her house however to her grand dinners she was not often invited only when they found themselves thirteen in order to be the fourteenth or else when some great personage declined and they were only eleven twelve being such a sacred number that the mistress of a house cannot receive eleven guests to do so the arrangement of the repast would be totally destroyed philomene stopped by madame aubier turning her back to the ocean for all those who were walking there presented it their faces she planted herself before the good lady after the preliminary parleyings she went straight to her point full of glory and puffed up with pride i shall have some people staying with me the coming week said she with an assured tone relations from the country asked madame aubier innocently some parisians this response was pronounced with the modesty of a collegian talking of his success with women two curious persons approached parisians i think even now not many are met with that dialette in the course of a year but at that time it was a thoroughly extraordinary event enchanted at the little effect she had produced madame crepin continued without being able to contain the exuberance of her joy the celebrated novelist charles verroy my cousin and his wife are to pass a week with me they opened their eyes wide the name of verroy had not penetrated very far into the bosom of this people of whom the most part ignored victor hugo's name and never imagined that at that very moment the poet in his land of exile opposite to them was perhaps contemplating france gilded by the rays of the setting sun but verroy was a celebrated novelist philomene declared it and that extraordinary man was coming to dielette some opened their eyes enormously others sceptical by nature shrugged their shoulders murmuring there is philomene bragging again madame aubier who was always indulgent and always practical received this astonishing news with calmness and after a second's meditation where will you lodge them philomene said she at my house in the room i have on the first floor they are sensible people my dear madame aubier they are reasonable enough to understand i cannot offer them a palace and to be contented with the little i possess madame crepin had at her service about a half dozen analogous phrases all relating to her modest position she must have gleaned them from novels which form the foundation of her reading for related to a man of letters she prided herself on being literary and even imperturbably held rightfully or wrongfully criticising opinions on works that had had the unhappiness of displeasing her these phrases were known to the entire village from its having heard them a thousand times and at that place in the conversation two ladies maliciously pushed each other's elbows in exchanging the quarter of a smile but madame crepin did not see them madame lavenel called madame aubier the old woman who was passing turned towards the group her head dressed in the normand coif which has now fallen into such desuetude and is replaced by a small working woman's cap which is far from equalling it either in picturesqueness or elegance but seeing philomene madame lavenel approached slowly here is our neighbour who is going to throw herself among great people said madame aubier smiling faintly fancy she is going to receive some parisians she is mistress to receive whom she likes answered the old woman her cunning eye scrutinized the face of her whom some day or other she thought to have as a daughter-in-law but philomene swallowed her pride with so modest an air that she could draw no inference from her examination 
lavenel joined his mother unaffectedly and the neighbors continued to walk slowly along the road insensibly philomene and her admirer found themselves walking in front at a short distance from the others you are going to have some pleasure distraction madame crepin said the grain and flour merchant dressed in his sunday best clad in a brown overcoat and a high hat that did not embellish him madame crepin sighed i have not stolen a little distraction she answered after so much sorrow humph said lavenel from the depths of his low and rather thick voice ah madame crepin the best distraction always is the society of a good husband ah that is very true moaned the cunning gossip when my poor crepin was alive i knew no greater satisfaction than to have him with me the devil take all widows lavenel thought they have a rage for talking to one of their dead husbands then he continued out loud forget that sad past madame crepin and then in other times when we were a girl and boy we called each other by our first names during your husband's lifetime i lost the habit of so doing but why should we not take it up again now when it cannot shock any one madame crepin not answering her lover waxed bolder listen philomene said he philomene had passed his lips like a letter thrown in a letter-box and he continued in a tenderer tone it is no use to ruminate over what no longer exists it is better to put something else in its place you said no to me but it is not no it is perhaps well you must say yes and make yourself a pleasant existence you told me your affairs were not arranged with the late captain's family the late captain's widow not replying he finished his phrase you must trust me with all that and it will not last long that is to be seen neighbor answered the lady of his thoughts perhaps they will decide to let me have what they owe me you wish me to believe that thought lavenel fortunately the underclerk has spoken sly jade philomene he went on out loud i have sought you for a long while i asked you to marry me nearly twenty years ago you would not have me if you think you have grown handsomer since then thought the widow you are greatly mistaken and i i have always wanted you ended the emboldened bachelor my mother has tormented me times enough to make me marry she has been to see brunettes and blondes enough so as to induce me to marry them but i had only thought for you bad one and i did not wish any one else so long as the captain lived i resigned myself to it all because you see it is not worth while to make oneself unhappy about what one cannot obtain but when i saw you a widow then i said to my mother that i did not wish any other wife than you and she answered me well my boy if it is philomene you want you must take her on condition that she wishes it rectified the widow crepin i will end by winning you the grain merchant answered insidiously besides i am not a match beneath you as far as fortune goes one makes a great deal by selling hay and bran i have fifty thousand francs in trade and a pretty roan mare i don't like roan horses replied philomene with a dreamy air philomene was not wrong for roan horses spotted with brown and white are not esteemed in the market on account of their coat we can change it if it is only that said lavenel with a conciliatory air there is something else answered the widow what then that i do not wish to marry again with no one with no one for the present but i may change when do you think you will have made your fortune lavenel why in ten years if you will give me your money added he parenthetically in the profoundest depth of his mind that is what is called a mental reservation and thanks to this simple reservation people who are in good favour with heaven can tell without lying the greatest falsehoods in the world at least that is what we are commanded to believe under pain of eternal fire perhaps lavenel did not believe enormously in fire eternal but he had a blind faith in the utility of mental reservations in what concerns the affairs of this world well said philomene we will see when you have made your fortune lavenel was as prudent as an old cat yet he could not help bounding at this and the incongruous gesture drew upon him the attention of several dieletois who were little accustomed to see him indulge in choreography in public he calmed himself at once and resumed the peaceful pace of an honest tradesman taking a walk thanks to sunday's repose ten years philomene you are making fun of me but my dear in ten years i shall be fifty and you 
i am not rude enough to mention a woman's age but the devil we made our first communion together and that's not a few years ago do you wish us to make people laugh well lavenel said the widow in a soft voice don't let us marry ah heavens it is not i who ask it bang said the flower merchant to himself overcome by the falling in of the edifice reared with such trouble since ten minutes well good evening then said he out loud raising his hand to his hat will you not take me as far as my home asked the village silly man with the most distant air in the world lavenel who was stupefied put his hat on his head again and docilely followed philomene to her door every one was still on the jetty the dogs alone who were lying on their master's thresholds animated the deserted place will you allow me to kiss you politely said the flower merchant removing his hat entirely for all answer philomene tendered him one after the other her two cheeks with their prominent cheekbones deeply coloured and received on each a resounding kiss that made two or three dogs more nervous than the others apparently raise their heads good evening neighbor said the widow entering her house good evening neighbor answered lavenel he took two steps and having reflected he thus expressed always mentally the result of his meditation i am in for what i have said may the devil take her chapter v the parisian and her cousin the following thursday an odd carriage a combination of jaunting car cabriolet and simple cart deposited monsieur and madame verroy before madame crepin's house the entire village either visible on the square or invisible behind window curtains assisted at this debarkation they saw with pleasure that the parisian was much prettier than her cousin and with regret that she wore a very simple black dress without trimmings exactly like a person of the place the simplicity of her attire and the small volume of her luggage determined the assistants to disperse especially as it was necessary to relate the event to those who less fortunate had not been witness of it madame verroy overthrew all established ideas in regard to feminine appearance in relation to character for instance a fat person is infallibly as gay as a greenfinch a dark tall person with regular features is noble and serious or else melancholy or else withered and sour endeavor to affirm the contrary and you will see how you will be treated by your readers marie verroy through a spirit of contradiction doubtless was tall and slender a brunette handsome rather than pretty and with this of an unfailing gaiety this gaiety that shone forth amidst all storms was her principal attraction and better than any one her husband knew what merit marie possessed in offering to all and continually her kind face and infectious laugh as soon as they had alighted from their extraordinary vehicle the only one they had been able to find and when this mysterious wheelbarrow had taken the road towards its home with inclining ways that must have caused frightful fear to the passers-by the newly arrived persons were conducted by philomene into a small white-washed room furnished with a bed a table and two chairs but in spite of this simplicity very pleasing thanks to some geraniums of a splendid red colour that were placed on the window-sill behold all i possess said philomene showing some ugly teeth that the brush rarely disturbed in their quietude i am poor my friends and can only offer you a poor abode but we will be very well off here exclaimed marie if only you will have the goodness to increase our ration of water for what there is there will not be sufficient to wash our hands madame crepin looked with an astonished air at the miniature pitcher in the middle of its bowl that was smaller still what a singular fancy to ask for so much water was it to drink she could offer them cider in preference for hers was of a good growth she did not fear to say so no my good friend answered marie laughing it is not to drink and cider would not be what we wish a good large jug of fresh water that is what we need for the moment philomene who made her toilette by dipping the end of a towel in the pitcher which she afterwards passed lightly over her face said to herself that her dear cousin was a trouble-maker but without any other objection she brought the jug that contained her daily supply thanks said the young woman to her and now in five minutes we will be at your disposition madame crepin disappeared and the husband and wife remaining alone looked with the same impulse at the washstand then raising their eyes to each other they burst out laughing together why do you laugh asked marie charles pointed at the bowl and the jug and without saying a word passed the corner of his pocket-handkerchief around his face it is the usual procedure here it seems it is summary and not expensive evil speaker his wife answered him you will do well not to make our cousin wait 
especially as she has not an obliging look she has not grown prettier since ten years what could you expect my dear age and sorrows five minutes after they were in effect seated at madame crepin's table it was a round table or rather a stand on which it was extremely dangerous to place anything except in the middle for the lightest weight made it infallibly tip over it is not known why this piece of furniture that is unserviceable on account of its inconvenience should be in high favour among the small provincial bourgeoisie the dinner was good even very good the defunct captain's wine made its appearance at dessert with some cherries sent by lavenel this latter not knowing from which side the wind would blow wished to win over the travellers and in truth the fruit was duly praised and the name of their owner passed philomene's lips ah but your neighbour is gallant said marie returning to the cherries philomene lowered her eyes seeing she did not reply madame verroy looked at her the dear soul would have much liked to have blushed but one does not blush at will however her embarrassment could not have failed to put out a blind man's eyes as charles said has he any intentions asked the latter smiling ah cousin after so many sorrows you do not suppose that i could think you no cousin but this gentleman perhaps has not had sorrows what is more natural then than that he should think of preparing some for himself oh cousin philomene put her handkerchief to her eyes but certainly cousin one prepares sorrows for oneself when one loves some one who does not care for one and since you do not care for him he is not what i want said philomene with a dignified air if i could ever think of marrying again it would not be a grain merchant who could make me forget the captain ah it would not be a grain merchant repeated charles incapable of containing the maliciousness that irritated him his social position is not high enough his wife gave him a warning blow under the table that nearly disturbed the equilibrium of the dessert but philomene just then was not disposed to understand his raillery no said she if ever i should change my name i owe it to my late husband not to descend below my present rank she rose to serve the coffee and turned her back on them with so much dignity that charles followed her with a respectful look that was full of admiration his wife tried to look out of the window and to calm a fit of uncontrollable laughter that shook her inwardly philomene returned with a waiter loaded with cups certainly said she continuing her thought it would not be worth while to have been the wife of a merchant captain to wed a simple tradesman and then besides i always detested trade but insinuated marie who had regained her calmness somewhat if the tradesman pleased you oh marie after so many sorrows can you believe that any other man than my husband could ever be anything to me no no cousin charles hastened to reply we do not believe it we have misunderstood is he a handsome fellow this gentleman of the cherries he is not bad but the captain was much better lavenel has straight hair and he wears his beard under his chin which is ugly charles contemplated philomene with a growing admiration for all his wife pulled him by the sleeve he did not take his eyes off her madame verroy succeeded in turning the conversation and asked to take a walk philomene led them everywhere that one could go on dry land and brought them home so fatigued that they went to bed without supper before closing his eyes verroy could not help saying to his wife our cousin is superb she will be married before three months she is a type leave her alone answered good marie it is not nice to make fun of her does she not do everything to please us but i am very well off here and i thank her for her hospitality only she will marry her flower merchant i do not believe it said marie why i don't know but i do not believe she will marry him well then she will marry another as for that it is very possible she would do better not to pretend to the contrary charles my dear said his wife to him you think yourself at paris don't forget that we are in normandy End of chapters four and five Chapter six, seven, and eight of Philomene's Marriages by Henri Greville, translated by Helen Stanley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six, the moss-grown house. How lovely this beautiful country is! How it knows how to make itself loved, and what regret one feels to leave it! Say, Marie, would you like us to buy a little house here? 
all that you wish charles one or several are there any houses to sell about here philomene philomene who was walking in front of her friends turned and stopped on the border of the narrow road there are and there are not those that are for sale are inhabitable and those that are habitable are not for sale admirable said charles laughing but to let cousin philomene started off walking again to let no there are none then marie we must give up this dream or else go a little farther away i would have preferred to keep you near me said philomene in a tender tone here it is only five days that we have been together and one would say so accustomed have i grown to you that i had never been separated from you good philomene said marie tapping her affectionately on her shoulder it is a misfortune of my character i am too loving i attach myself too quickly and so only prepare sorrows for myself come cousin said verroy in a conciliatory tone the world is not solely peopled with selfish and ungrateful persons i did not mean to say that said philomene in a voice full of tears but you see i am so unattractive who could think of growing fond of me i have no more relations no friends well and me yes my good marie you are right i am wrong also to speak to you of my griefs the unhappy should not afflict the happy ones of this world with their sorrows charles who was slightly impatient knocked off with his cane the flowering heads of a half-dozen shrubs planted along the roadside this little emotional scene was not the first one he had witnessed and verroy whose criticising sense had been sharpened by observation had asked himself since a few moments whether philomene were a good creature whom provincial life and a particular aptitude made naturally insupportable or whether she were simply a pretty specimen of a false good woman while he was thus guillotining the flowers on the cliff marie had gone ahead and taking philomene's arm had lavished on her all the ordinary consolation that one offers in similar circumstances something astonished the young woman she who always so readily found kind words in her heart when brought in the presence of some wretchedness and misfortune found nothing to say but ordinary commonplaces it is because we have not seen one another for so long she said to herself in explanation we love each other still but we know one another no longer silence came philomene replaced her handkerchief in her pocket and the three pedestrians walked along on the same line the path having grown broader suddenly through one of those surprises so frequently occurring in that extraordinary country a small valley opened on their left in the valley ran a stream a plaything of a stream a mathematician would have calculated that its mother the spring did not give out more than twenty litres an hour but the pretty stream cared little for mathematicians and mathematics it was not near being imprisoned in cast-iron tubes for public alimentation and salubrity it ran along playing innocently in the sunshine stopping here and there in a thick tuft of cresses between banks of mint among enormous clusters of reeds and after having fallen a dozen times over large stones according to the common destiny of all that exists and advances in this world it lost itself among the pebbles and disappeared drowned in the waves of the sea a hundred yards farther on in the valley rose a cluster of trees how do the branching beech trees that resemble miniature banyan fig trees manage to brave the wind how do the ash trees that are sheltered by the beeches succeed in overtopping their protecting barrier and how sheltered by one and the other do the apple fields stretch out lazily over the gentle undulating hilltops the farmers of the country know not the reason why and savants who study arboriculture in books ignore it still more but the beeches know and that is why they bend their reddish-gray tops whose foliage lasts so short a time under the wrath of the ocean tempests their branches that are so closely entangled in each other form an impenetrable refuge and behind their double high and mossy hedge of vegetation that is bathed by the warm currents of the gulf stream displays itself in an almost insolent luxury amid the cluster of trees a small gray house sheltered itself that was covered with superb lichens that dotted themselves in great brilliant yellow spots on the old granite background above the front door that was low and narrow might be read deeply graven in an enormous stone in characters three inches high f b p joseph hensey seventeen fifty seven an old moss-covered stone trough a gray wooden fence eaten away by lichens two stone balls that had formerly crowned the stanchions of the front door were the only ornaments of the small grass-covered courtyard 
a pathway trodden from the fence to the front door proved however that the house was not entirely abandoned some large apple trees stretched their branches over the neighbouring wall as far as the middle of the courtyard and the stream crossed it hardly kept within its bounds by a sort of stone gutter heavens how pretty it is exclaimed marie charles took off his hat to the little house i salute thee said he to it thou art an honest dwelling-place so honest that faust would not have dared to come and seek marguerite here honest people built thee loved thee and were born and died under thy humble thatched roof thou art the abode of my dreams o oh, small house whoever your proprietor may be to whom does this treasure belong asked marie philomene drew out an old worn key from under her skirts she had two enormous and mysterious pockets two abysses from whence came forth according to circumstances things the most unlikely to meet therein it was my grandfather's father who built it said she as she fastened the rails securely you know marie that your mother was a miss hensy and that it is thus we are related then murmured marie this must be the first home of my family charles approached his wife and took her by the hand these two who though worldly and parisians to the marrow of their bones did not disdain their humble origin verroy though not born of a fisherman but of a provincial notary esteemed his wife of equally good origin as himself philomene had opened the door and preceded them he kept marie's hand in his and they passed together over the threshold of the family home the low room was lit by a window with small lozenge-shaped panes set in lead an old-fashioned bedstead closed on three sides was built in to the end of the room and in a partition of the bed an opening exposed to view a very small cross-barred window that looked out on the back of the house an ivy plant that ornamented the outside of the wall curtained it with its branches and foliage and gave it the appearance of a church window the curtains of dark blue linen edged with fringe made of red and blue balls dated probably from the foundation of the house a chestnut wood cupboard fastened in the wall in the embrasure of the window that was wainscoted to the ceiling was a bench that made a refuge square shaped as it approached the chimney-place a table of the same wood heavy and immovable composed the rustic furniture of this dwelling which is like a thousand others in that country it was there said philomene pointing to the bed that our grandfather was born marie and where he died asked the young woman in a low voice no there said madame crepin showing the corner of the chimney-place silence reigned for a moment in the low room the young people became very serious and still holding each other's hands felt a world of thoughts stir their brains philomene opened the cupboard the horrid beasts cried she they have gnawed the last wooden spoon fortunately here is one in the mouse-trap verroy and his wife started at her discordant voice silence hardly disturbed by a word whispered in the ear seemed to them scarcely respectful enough for this family asylum but philomene went to and fro moving everything and making great floods of dust fly that because it was venerable choked one's throat none the less to whom does this house belong asked charles for the second time why to me answered madame crepin without stopping where can the large armchair be ah i have taken it upstairs there is not anything to sit down on here she slowly ascended the stairway and soon returned dragging after her without any ceremony an old straw armchair the form and mouldings were in pure louis the fifteenth style the straw had been changed very often but the last time it had been done was at least forty years ago and it had become the colour of new bronze where does that chair come from asked verroy it is the one that was at the corner of the fire in the chimney-place it was on this that they found grandfather dead one june evening when they returned from harvesting they took him his bowl of soup and found he was cold you cannot remember that marie you were too young i do not even know whether you were born whilst talking philomene made the armchair turn round on one of its back legs and administered it a volley of strokes with her apron with the design of dusting it the young people without saying a word sat down on the chestnut wood bench where marie's mother had climbed when she was very small holding on to the table so as not to fall there said madame crepin when she had finished her dusting sit down raising her eyes she saw that her guests had not waited to do so and then she sat down herself without any ceremony in the grandfather's armchair it is horrid here said she it is dirty 
one cannot drive the mice away but i come here from time to time to air it a little i profited by your being here to do so since you love old things so much philomene said marie hardly raising her voice sell me this house a light blue as steel traversed the widow's eyes she had found a new vein in the mine of life she smiled and showed her teeth which was a very imprudent thing to do in any case you don't dream of such a thing she answered what could one do with such a hovel for love of the family replied madame verroy but it is in the family my dear i beg you to do so philomene the young woman insisted cousin it would give us so much pleasure added her husband come now my dear friends this is a joke i have determined not to part with it then let us this house we were looking for something to hire this is what we want we will have some furniture brought hire it to you certainly not but if it pleases you you can live here as long as you like i am enchanted to be able to be agreeable to you but philomene marie insisted you are not rich allow us to pay you the rent of this house it is worth something it is insignificant i would prefer to give it to you and give it most willingly when will you come here why said marie looking at charles we had the intention of passing the summer somewhere near granville we would be better off here nothing hinders us from installing ourselves here at once that is to say next week to-morrow if you choose or rather no you promised me a week and i will not give you grace of an hour but on thursday you will be free to come and catch the mice and drive away the spiders as much as your heart desires after having expressed their gratitude the young people visited the house a cellar was opposite to the room they were in and on the first floor two bedrooms separated by a small cabinet reproduced the same arrangement it is paradise declared charles when the inspection was over we will spend a delightful summer here and i am going to work like a steam engine how can one like an ugly hut like that exclaimed philomene putting the key in her pocket while they crossed the courtyard on their way out a sad isolated dirty place stop look at the weeds they grow everywhere ah you will have a great deal to do to clean it up but cousin we will not clean it up as you like all the same you have a strange taste our cousin is not poetical observed marie in a low voice while philomene stopped to close the gate nor has she the bump of family veneration she is an odd woman say marie how happy we are going to be there the young woman clasped his arm without replying and they set forth on the road to diolette chapter seven coffee and conversation it was a pretty house in truth and the young people were soon installed in it the upper rooms were clean and gay a few maitres of light cretonne made in less than a week a comfortable abode of its hospitable walls madame crepin who was brisk and merry went and came unceasingly on the road with a basket on her arm she had procured a servant found furniture furnished linen and in exchange for so many kind services could monsieur and madame verroy do otherwise than ask her to dinner she brought a half dozen eggs and passed the day at la huserie what was more natural she presented her cousins to her neighbors and friends in the place besides every one was very curious to see a celebrated man they found everywhere the most cordial welcome according to the kind custom of the country where hospitality and benevolence shown towards strangers are so natural that they do not even consider them as virtues one house alone showed a frowning face lavenel's the grain merchant had not witnessed without distrust the intrusion of this new element in philomene's life at first he lavenel wished nothing to do with these people what had they come to find in that country was there not room enough elsewhere under the sun that they had to come to disturb his plans however he could not turn his back upon them and he endeavoured to give his face a less sullen expression when he saw that without doubt the verroys had the intention of passing the summer by his native waters madame lavenel who was more wary had not failed to reprimand her son from the beginning about his conduct and she presented her homage to marie verroy with the best grace in the world she invited her to eat fruit in her garden picked a basketful which she put on her arm as she was leaving and as she was obliged to return the basket on her next visit she then offered the young woman coffee between men to offer coffee means to swallow one's self and to make one's guests swallow a considerable quantity of small glasses of brandy among women the thing is of less consequence 
sugar plays a greater role in it and a little glass of liqueur replaces the libations of those gentlemen not however without the coffee having received its traditional addition of alcohol but only in the cup madame lavenel did not disdain a tear in her coffee and was much astonished to see marie refuse the decanter she had hoped that the gentle warmth of the beverage added to the expansion of conversation would permit her to question her prospective daughter-in-law's cousin a little disappointed she did not abandon her resolution however but confined herself to attacking things from a greater distance philomene did not assist at this little feast madame lavenel had taken the precaution to choose a day when she would be obliged to absent herself to go to the market at Pieux so it was not necessary for the good dame to watch out of the window to assure herself that their conversation would not be intruded upon after the indispensable preliminaries such as a visit to the garden the making of a bouquet and divers compliments and kindnesses the two ladies went towards the low room adjoining the shop and there to madame verroy's great surprise who much desired to leave the cover was laid she had to sit and take some coffee that had been made in anticipation by madame lavenel's vigilant hands and which had not improved by passing two hours set in a bowl of hot water marie verroy performed her duty however and showed the best grace possible while boring herself for a half hour and more she was not a little astonished to hear her amiable hostess question her cautiously about her childhood her relations of friendship and parentage with philomene and her family in a word to make her undergo a complete examination the questions followed each other in a certain chronological order which enabled marie who was by the way very shrewd and very sensible to understand madame lavenel's designs she permitted herself therefore to be questioned replying the exact truth to all her interrogations but never anything more at the end of a few moments madame lavenel perceived that she had to do with a very strong party and from that moment she had recourse to the supreme resource of cunning people she spoke quite frankly you doubtless know my dear lady said she to her that i would not have taken the liberty of speaking to you about your family if i had not been moved by feelings stronger than myself here she heaved a sigh the desire of my heart i can surely tell it to you has always been to have madame crepin for my daughter-in-law my poor boy has always loved her has never loved any one but herself and i would have liked before my death to see my son settled as he wished ah it is very cruel for a mother to depart from this world leaving her children all alone isolated and without friendship the good dame's heart seemed to swell with bitterness marie verroy felt obliged to say some kind words to her you are still young madame lavenel you have plenty of time to think about all that no you see my dear lady one does not know who will live or who will die i should have liked to have seen my son married and since he wishes no one else but philomene when she became a widow and he made his desire known to me i said to him well my boy if it is philomene you want you must take her that was very wise on your part said marie yes my dear lady it was a sacrifice because philomene you see is not as young nor as rich as might be the woman to whom my son could aspire but i am willing to accept everything so as to see him happy marie thought that to call her daughter-in-law old and poor was not a very amiable way in which to accept her but one must take people as they are and she never breathed a word there is an obstacle madame lavenel said at last seeing her visitor would not come to her aid what is it philomene does not wish to marry again it is very unfortunate that your son should have set his choice exactly on a woman who does not wish to marry again said marie endeavouring to assume a commiserating look that did not come of itself oh yes as to that yes but i have thought in my small mind for i am only a poor ignorant woman madame verroy not like yourself who know so many things i have thought that if philomene were well advised she might perhaps change her mind do you think so asked marie in a very dubitative tone i am sure of it that poor philomene loves her family too much it is through the excess of her good heart she told me the other day that if she married again it would be very horrid on her part for she would thus deprive of their inheritance those of her family who had a right to it upon my word exclaimed madame verroy that is a very extraordinary idea it is as i tell you said madame lavenel 
who really did not lie for two days before she had held this strange conversation with her what madness it is worse than don quixote the young woman could not help saying laughingly and who then may these heirs be for whom madame crepin wishes to make a vow of eternal widowhood but i spoke to you just now of your family i do not see any one else but yourself i exclaimed madame verroy with so much vivacity that she nearly upset her coffee i why she is hardly ten years older than i am she says she is ill that she is sure not to live long and she does not wish to despoil you of what is coming to you but madame lavenel exclaimed marie a little nervous at seeing this delicate question agitated with so little ceremony there are other relations besides myself i am sure and then there is her husband's family and after all one is quite free to give one's fortune to whom one likes it is yourself to whom she wishes to give it i do not want it said marie energetically you can tell her i do not want it it is dreadful to think a woman so near my own age should think of making me her heir no i do not wish to hear it spoken of you will not prevent her doing it if it is her idea insisted madame lavenel she would do a great deal better to marry again continued marie following her thought she thinks of approximate death because she is lonely and sad but in the bosom of a new home she would soon forget her funereal thoughts ah yes said madame lavenel enchanted to see her bait had taken you should tell her so but do not mention me you understand she forbade me whispering a word to you about it she would be angry and that would not advance my son's affairs that is very true i will advise marriage in general to her madame lavenel remained silent a moment the first comer is not what philomene wishes without being reprehensible in anything she has her little fancies and her temper is not always good what would suit her would be a man not too young for she is thirty-eight years old steady good not liking drink in a word an honest man take my bear thought marie she added out loud like your son is it not so madame lavenel every one preaches up his own saint and if monsieur lavenel has loved philomene since so long a time he knows the defects she may have and he is determined to pass over them how well you talk said madame lavenel full of admiration one sees very well that you have read books as for me i am only a poor good countrywoman and i do not know how to say what i think but i know very well that you are an honest lady and very nice for all that the two women separated and madame lavenel as she was arranging her coffee cups said to herself she had not lost her day chapter eight marie's invitation when charles verroy heard of madame crepin's intentions he was at first in a very bad humour i am sure said he to his wife that that great simpleton of a philomene told her of it expressly that it might be repeated to us oh my dear can you think it i am sure of it the intention may be good on her part but one does not tell of such things one does them it shows a want of tact that i did not think her capable of a little saddened for she really loved her cousin the young woman determined to take philomene aside and give her some good advice necessitated by her lonely position why do you not marry again she said to her one afternoon while charles stretched out on a mat was trying to read his journal by the last gleams of daylight they were beyond hearing distance and descended the road that led to the sea after all i have suffered replied philomene my poor husband was so good so affectionate that i shall never find another like him you might not find his like said marie but you could find another who did not resemble him at all but whom you could love just the same life is so long when one is all alone philomene put on a sad face which gave her a still more morose appearance than ordinarily yes life is long if only my husband's family was nice to me but i have no one on whom i can count no one who will even render me a service in case of need we are here said marie gently yes you so i love no one but you when one thinks that since my husband's death no one of his family has entered my doors they look upon me as dead i presume however did they not show you some favours in regard to the inheritance this much that the captain had some debts and i paid them replied philomene sourly if after that they left me the recovery of the credits it was only just 
without doubt without doubt and they have not been nice to you philomene began a long litany of complaints against her mother-in-law her brother-in-law her three sisters-in-law their uncles aunts cousins nephews etc etc all of them had always disgraced and detested her all wished her evil and she returned it to them well not in wishing them evil for thank god she had never wished that to anybody but she did not love them at all and would never seek to do them pleasure for it would be only losing her trouble when she had finished and stopped to catch her breath marie answered her quietly why do you not marry that would be the best way to punish them for their bad acts so they will not have my inheritance be easy they will not have it they turn around it but they will be nicely caught it is not much and a poor widow has a great deal of trouble to live on it but the little there is will pass under their noses marie kept silence an idea that had already come to her ran in her brain why do you not put your fortune in a life interest said she to her that would make you sure of leaving nothing to any one and would permit you to live more at your ease philomene did not answer if you wished to marry again continued the young woman that would be another thing one is very glad to leave something to one's children but since you are resolved to remain a widow no said madame crepin brusquely i do not want to rid myself of my fortune do you wish me to tell you something it is yourself who will have it marie shook her head you are too young said she to think of that do not speak of it again i beg of you you shall have it insisted philomene you are the only one who has shown me any affection you and your husband have alone thought of coming to see me in my solitude you have not disdained my poverty it is just that you should be rewarded she threw herself on madame verroy's neck weeping and clasped her for a long while on her heart marie touched by her sadness consoled her as best she knew how and with kind words succeeded in stopping her effusion and her tears i am nervous madame crepin said at last when she had recovered herself a little it is the retired life i lead never any pleasures never any distractions it is not very astonishing that i should be easily overcome ah my good marie how happy you are you live amid pleasures you have a thousand resources of which i have not even an idea come and see us at paris said marie come and pass two weeks with us we have an apartment larger than is necessary you will not disturb us in any way leave here with us in the first days of autumn you do not think of such a thing i am not rich enough to give myself such costly fancies the journey is not such a great affair remarked madame verroy not for you but for me it is a very great expense you cannot imagine the little i possess well said marie grown a little impatient you will make the voyage at my expense you would not accept anything for the rent of your house i have certainly the right to offer you this much you are too good my dear friend i thank you and-you accept i refuse go away then exclaimed marie and don't come to talk to me about your want of distractions and your loneliness for i will pity you no more philomene took up the thread of her discourse she always had a bobbin of it ready and her lamentations lasted until when charles not being able to see any more came to join them i have invited her to come and see us at paris said his wife to him seeing him approach you did well but she does not wish to do so she is wrong the young man answered phlegmatically you refuse i fancy cousin that we may urge you more warmly philomene was rather afraid of her cousin whose calmness and reserved prudence embarrassed her not knowing what was underneath it she laughed and showed her yellow teeth i assure you cousin it is not to make myself urged said she then you will come it is only a question of time madame crepin took leave of the young people and returned to her home asking herself whether m verroy parisian as he was would not be cleverer than herself philomene crepin chapter six seven and eight